Welcome to the FCICA webinar series. Thank you for joining us. This webinar will be recorded. The recorded session will be housed on the FCICA Member Center in this educational portal. Mark your calendars for these upcoming webinars. Thursday, April 8th, join us for Protection on a Roll, Crack Isolation and Sound Reduction Membrane, presented by Sonia Most, Product Manager, Mapai. And on Thursday, April 22nd, it's Thick Core Gypsum Underlayment, the what, why, where, and how, and its preparation for finished drawing, an educational webinar presented by Seth Kabarnik. Director of Technical Services, Ardex Americas. Visit FCICA.com to view and register for these webinars. FCICA has recently updated the safety book, Start With Safety. It is available electronically, free to members, and printed versions are available for $185. The safety book is an essential item to have in your office and on every job site. Purchase it on FCICA's website today. Thank you for joining us for Commercial Flooring Installation, Fastening for the Future. We are pleased to introduce our presenter, Dave Darche, National Market Manager, Adhesives A&D with Bona US. Speaker Dave Darche is the National Market Manager for Bona and has been in the wood flooring industry for over 35 years. He is a National Wood Flooring Association certified wood floor inspector and serves on the National Wood Flooring Association Architect and Design Committee. Welcome, Dave. We're excited to have you. I'm going to turn the controls over to you. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, good afternoon to some of you. Good morning to the rest of you. Uh, I'm Dave with Bona. Uh, I've been with Bona for 18 years. And prior to joining Bona, I installed and finished wood floors for over 20 years. So one of the things I like about today's presentation is I just feel that I'm sharing with you some of the things and the stories uh, that I've observed over the years. So while some of this information has the potential to be a little bit dry, uh, hopefully that won't be the case. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to mention that, you know, Bona is a 102 year old company and we have a very good history and heritage when it comes to wood floors so with that i will get into the actual presentation and i'm going to start with a fun little fact here that has nothing to do with wood floors but it has everything to do with PowerPoint presentations. The average person who does a PowerPoint speaks 135 words a minute. Most of you can read upwards of 300 words per minute, especially with the monitor right in front of you. I, on the other hand, speak 97 words a minute. And there is a reason. I am from Boston. And if I do not enunciate every word, the most hideous accent on the planet will manifest itself. And I am simply trying to save you from that. Because trust me, nobody wants to hear Cliff Clavin from Cheers deliver a CEU. But I also tell you that because I want you to know that I am not going to read the presentation to you. We have all sat through way too many of those types of presentations, and that is not going to happen today. But what I am going to do is highlight specific things on the slides and just elaborate on them a little bit. So as you look at these learning objectives, you know, we talk about benefits, process, differences in effect. And today I primarily want to talk about um, uh, benefits and features. You know, every manufacturer talks about their FNBs, their features and benefits. And probably the best way to illustrate it would be if, if I was going to sell you a phone, um, I might say, well, it has a very fast internet connection. And that would be a feature of the phone. But if I explain to you that if your child ever got lost, 
that they would get home faster, that's a feature as a parent that would probably be more important to you. So we're gonna talk about some of these benefits uh, as well as some of the features as well. You know, never before has home, health, and humanity become so important to each and every one of us. And I can tell you right now that our view of home, health, and humanity has really changed uh, over the last year. Uh, the space that we inhabit, the interactions that we make, uh, we are really scrutinizing them. And a lot of us have changed uh, the way we go about doing things. I'd like to read a report that came out of uh, ASID, their resiliency report, only because I think it uh, sums up the challenge that many are, faces, are facing from you know design perspective. They mentioned that the challenge to our industry is how do we better address human health and sustainability within the framework of resiliency and create spaces that reinforce the better social habits we now know that we need. So I thought that was very crafted very well because we are talking about spaces and adhesives obviously have a very big impact on these spaces as we will learn as we go through uh, this presentation. So if third-party certification was important before, it is definitely important now. Um, when we look at third-party certification, particularly the one that we have up there on the screen, Green Guard and Green Guard Gold, that Green Guard Gold certification, I believe it was about 10 or 11 years ago, used to be their hospital and schools designation. So it is a very high criteria. I believe there's like over 360 uh, specific VOCs that get tested in order to be able to earn Green Guard Gold certification. So generally, it's about twice as um, more stringent than the typical green guard. You know, I know that when it comes to buying products, uh, we all want the best thing for our families. And I think looking at third party certification is an important step in that process. And then as far as a specifying note is concerned, I would tell you that anytime uh, an architect or a designer specifies unfinished wood floors, low VOC uh, adhesives, varnishes, and finishes, that that contributes to your total uh, lead points that can be earned for your certified, your silver, and your gold and platinum certification levels. So one of the things that has always appealed to me about the wood flooring industry, and I find it very fascinating, is the sustainable message of wood floors. And I'll give you a personal example of this. I remember years ago, I was working in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I had to tear up a section of the floor. Well, underneath the flooring was the newspaper from the day that floor was installed, because everybody on this call knows that newspaper does a really good job of <laughs> protecting against moisture. Well, anyways, as I'm looking through uh, this time capsule of history, I came across an advertisement for the very floor that I was replacing. It was the old uh, style 3 8 by 2 flooring. And the advertised price on it was three cents a board foot. Now, granted, the material that I was replacing it with was more than three cents a board foot at the time. But the point is, by the time I wove that repair in, sanded, used a stain, dye, and coating techniques, that floor from 1932, not only did it not look like it had been repaired, it easily now had 40, 50, 60 more years of life expectancy to it. And so for me, that sustainable message has always been important. When I mentioned at the beginning uh, that I'm from Boston, I lied, I'm actually 40 miles south of Boston. 
and I live in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And last year, Plymouth celebrated the 400 year anniversary of the uh, Mayflower and the pilgrims arriving. And so it's not unusual in this neck of the woods to find floors that are well over, not just 100 years old, but even 200 years. I'd like to read to you a comment uh, that was published last year. This comes from the IVL Swedish Environmental Research Institute. And what that report stated is that when you um, refinish a wood floor, there is a 78% carbon footprint reduction when doing so. And by the way, the percentage is higher on the resilient side. It's like 92% reduction of carbon footprint. And that in total, there is a 90% savings in resources when you factor in transportation, electricity, other materials, and so forth. So once again, anytime we specify a wood floor, install a wood floor, and then are able to treat it down the road, it definitely contributes towards that sustainable message uh, that I've always found important. So there is a lot of good information out uh, and available uh, to the wood flooring professional. And this good information helps our industry to grow. There's also a lot of bad information and misinformation out there uh, that we need to decide uh, between. I know that the FCICA uh, publishes very good articles on a regular basis that help all of us uh, to uh, raise the bar when it comes to our profession. And some of these resources are uh, very valuable and practical. But when it comes to guidelines, uh, I will tell you this, that even the National Wood Flooring Association will tell you, and they have it in writing, and I'll read it to you, that the manufacturer's recommendations for specific products should always supersede the recommendations contained in this guideline. So generally, manufacturers have a much better understanding of their products and how they behave and perform than uh, organizations do. So I think that's important. The other thing is I would tell you, uh, these sources of information are far better than what you heard the guy on the internet say. Sometimes that's not a good source of uh, information. And uh, one of the things I love about uh, this uh, particular photo that you're looking at right now as an inspector, um, this is a good position to admire a wood floor from. It is not the position that an inspection should be conducted from. So to understand the future of fastening, I always find that it's helpful to understand the past. I'm kind of a history buff. And so I always like examining history and how origins came about. And when we look at the origins of adhesive, uh, for many years, uh, it was pretty much tar tar over dirt. And so uh, I actually even have a photograph of one of the uh, tiles at Versailles being repaired. And yes, underneath it, yeah, there was tar uh, securing it because tar obviously has a degree of adhesion when it comes to securing uh, these large medallion type panels. Well, I would say late in the 1800s, uh, coal tar uh, was cut back uh, with naphtha and some other things. And then um, there was this uh, miracle binder that gave uh, these products, this cutback adhesive, a really good consistency. And it was called asbestos. So you can see that why uh, that product was something that eventually had to go away. And in its place, newer technology uh, came about. One of those technologies was PVAs or polyvinyl acetates. And these were essentially waterborne adhesives. And we used it for parquet floors. You know, since the mid 40s, there's hundreds of millions of square feet 
of this uh, parquet in the marketplace, whether it was paper face parquet, whether it was web back. And uh, it did a really good, uh, effective job at bonding uh, the parquet to the substrate. But as you can see from the photo, you are only able to install a certain size uh, pieces of wood. You have other technologies that occurred over time, epoxies that were very, very um, solid, but they were also very brittle. And since we all know that wood floor, floors move naturally, a lot of times those would despond. And there are other types of adhesives that certainly have come onto the market. Uh, one of the ones that I remember um, using or being exposed to the first time other than PVAs were chlorinated solvents. Uh, we used these to install uh, what we called at the time laminated wood floors, uh, something that we would refer to as an engineered wood floor. Uh, but once again, we were only able to install uh, relatively narrow widths and shorter pieces that were no longer than, than three feet. The, uh, the technology also required um, that you would spread the adhesive, you would allow it to flash off for about 45 minutes. And then when you push the flooring into that particular adhesive, there was a chemical reaction that bonded that floor to the substrate. So for a lot of us, this was the first adhesive that many of us use day in and day out, aside from uh, PVAs. And uh, a lot of us liked working with this adhesive. Uh, you had to be a little bit careful to make sure that, you know, windows and doors were open because uh, you needed quite a bit of ventilation in using these products. But unfortunately, chlorinated solvent was contributing to uh, the hole in the ozone. Uh, these trichlorothone things that were used uh, were very, very similar to the aerosols uh, that were in cans at the time. And so what happened in the mid 90s, uh, it goes by many names, but most of us know it as the Montreal uh, Protocol. Every, um, every um, member of the United Nations actually signed this particular treaty. It was one of the first climate changing pieces of legislation that had ever happened globally. And originally it was supposed to take place in the mid early 2000s, and it was actually enacted uh, in 1995. And so a lot of us at the time bought as much of this adhesive because we did not know what technology was going to be in its place. But before I get into technology, there were some other things that were going on that helped us to understand um, and, and make sure that adhesives would meet the challenges of the future. And that's understanding the relationship of wood and moisture. And when you look at this map, you can see that we have different moisture content, indoor moisture content, depending on where we live in North America. Some environments are very dry, some environments are very moist. And so we need to make sure that the adhesive is able to perform in these different types of climates. The other thing that there is a more recent understanding, at least for most of us, uh, quite a few of you have known about this for a long time, and that's when it comes to regional climate variations. And I like uh, the second bullet point, if you take a look at that, that wood floors can be installed successfully, but different methods have to be um, done. And I, I'll share a, a personal experience where I really learned this. Uh, so the, the fellow who trained and tutored me, Howard Brickman, um, had a project over in Bermuda. And so essentially we had to take wood, Appalachian maple that was around 8% moisture content, ship it in a container to Bermuda. Well, we know that the moisture content of wood indoors in Bermuda was gonna be around 13, possibly 14%. Well, what do you do? Well, you start in the middle, you dry lay the floor, you factor in 
uh, the DCC, the dimensional change coefficient, Howard did all the math, and we dry laid that floor, and I think we left it three feet from the wall. We left, we came back three weeks later, and it looked like the Keebler elves had gone in there and installed the floor because all that uh, racked area was now tight because once again, the wood uh, grew in dimensional size because of that dimensional change coefficient. And I believe the wood at that point was maybe not even a foot, nine inches from the wall. So understanding climate variations goes a long way towards installing wood floors successfully. And then if you look at the moisture content uh, of this slide, what's interesting about the relative humidity and the temperature in that little green box, it's where most of us feel comfortable. I tend to be on the low side. I like my home at 62 degrees. That's where I feel comfortable. I have another wood flooring contractor friend of mine who likes 72 degrees, and I find that very uncomfortable. But overall, when we look at environments where we feel comfortable, wood has a comfort zone as well. So when I got into the business, every major manufacturer of wood floors had in writing on their specification sheets, bring the wood into the home, let it sit and acclimate for two weeks, and then install it. And I remember thinking at that time, why would I bring wood flooring into someone's home in August, especially here in New England, let it sit for two weeks, then install it, and then have the heating season kick on in a month or so, and now all that gained moisture would be lost. Well, once again, fortunately, I had Howard to thank because Howard drilled into my head over and over again. He said, Dave, acclimation is not a time thing. Acclimation is a moisture thing. So when we think about it from that standpoint, we want to take unconditioned wood and let it equilibrate to a conditioned environment. If we have conditioned wood and we bring it into a conditioned space, then we can install immediately because the floor has achieved equilibrium. What we don't want to do is take conditioned wood and have it sit in an unconditioned space. That is not going to allow the wood to align. I remember uh, doing an inspection a number of years ago and uh, the contractor had installed the floor in August, let it sit for two weeks. And when I went to look at the floor, I mean, it had cracks that the cat could have fallen through. and all he could say to me was, but I acclimated it. I acclimated it. I, I, I let it acclimate. And once again, he took conditioned wood and acclimated it to an unconditioned space. And by the way, no one lives in unconditioned spaces. That's why we need to take wood and make sure that it is in a conditioned environment. So a couple, couple of months ago, I was on a webinar and I heard the, uh, the speaker say a couple of times that wood is a living, breathing material. And I had to chuckle to myself um, because wood is not a living, breathing material. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. And I think what that speaker meant to say is that wood behaves like a living, breathing material. It has a touch, a feel, a depth, a texture, a dimension that makes it feel like it's alive. You know, wood and moisture have a long history of association together. Think about it. 
if you have a thousand square feet of wood flooring and it's around call it eight seven or eight percent moisture content there is already over 200 pounds of water existing within that floor over 25 gallons so the relationship between moisture and wood is not a bad thing it's that excessive moisture that becomes the problem and so once again we can figure out by using the dimensional change coefficients and figure out exactly the dimensional change that will take place within a certain species depending on the time of year that it's being installed i like the the photograph on the lower bottom there uh, this is relatively common uh, here in the uh, east coast um, uh, even in plymouth because a lot of times essentially air dried wood was installed <laughs> inside the, the closed up home and it would shrink and you would have these gaps it does seem to be a popular look here uh, most new consumers they want everything tight but this is certainly uh, the way that we see many wood floors uh, here in New England. So when it comes to moisture conditions, we want to make sure that moisture is identified. You know, I, I love that little illustration in the top uh, because if I told a child to go into a room and find the moisture condition, uh, he could probably find it, especially if the humidifier is the only thing running in the room and I put a couple of pieces of candy on top of that humidifier, he's going to be able to find the moisture. And so we know that there are known moisture conditions. What we want to make sure of is that we don't install over uncorrected known moisture conditions. And here's one of the reasons why. So much of the moisture that we encounter is not able to be seen. It's happening behind the curtain. Yes, we can identify a spill here uh, or condensation there, but a lot of what can affect wood floors are something that we simply cannot walk into and assess. So I think it's very important that we understand sources of moisture and how to deal with them. So a report was issued a couple of years ago that stated that since 1800, there have been over 670 incidents involving ships running into icebergs. We all know the famous one, but there's a lot of fatalities that happen due to this uh, taking place. A lot of it uh, happens off the coast of Newfoundland, Newfoundland by the way. Uh, the conclusion of the report is that it's not the tip of the iceberg <laughs> that will hurt you. Uh, there is so much going on underneath the surface um, that we need to pay attention to in order to successfully fasten for the future. And so we're going to go through some of that. Obviously, surface preparation is a huge key you know in our industry we don't talk about level floors we talk about flat floors we know that the uh, installation threshold is three sixteenths of an inch within 10 feet but when we stay within those parameters we are able to successfully with adhesive technology today we are able to install solid nine inch wide planks over gypcrete and concrete and certainly surface preparation goes a long way towards making that happen and to further illustrate this idea of a flat subfloor i was over in germany i want to say about four and a half years ago and i was in a showroom of uh, one of the bonus certified craftsmen over there and in his showroom, he had floors that were 14, 16 inches wide, and they were like well over an inch thick. In fact, one of them I saw was like an inch and a quarter. And so I asked him, what kind of nailing machine do you use to install these floors? 
uh, he looked at me like I was an idiot. And I get that look a lot, by the way. And he explained to me that they don't nail anything over there. They glue everything down. Everything is over those uh, uh, gypsum screed-based systems. And I will tell you that the reason why they are able to do such wide planks is because their tolerances uh, aren't even a 16th of an inch over 10 feet. So you can see that their substrate preparation goes far beyond anything that we are doing here in North America. Now, when it comes to testing, you know, for years, all we had available was qualitative testing. In other words, we had some good professionals who could go into a project, evaluate it, do a bond test, MAT test, phenyl thaline, and figure out if the installation could proceed. And many of those installations were very successful. And then we had other people who would go in, look at the floor and say, yeah, it's, it's in good shape, I can install it, and uh, had failures because of it. Well, now that we have quantitative testing, why would we ever go back to qualitative? And I'll compare it to this. You go to the doctor's office and he looks at you and says, yes, we need to apply leeches. And now keep in mind, leeches has been a treatment for hundreds if not thousands of years. Well, you're in his office and you look to your left and there's an MRI machine and you're like, well, shouldn't I go in there <laughs> to find out what I really need? And he's like, no, I can tell by looking. Well, I can tell you this, you're probably gonna do one of the fastest 40s that has ever taken place on the planet because no one wants to go through that. My point is, now that we have so many manufacturers of great quantitative uh, uh, tools, why would we ever go back to qualitative? Why would we ever allow a manufacturer to tell us, no, just go in and if the floor is dry, you can go ahead and proceed. Let's not go back there. And then keep in mind when it comes to quantitative testing, we know what both tests are, calcium chloride, RH. For the longest time, ASTM recognized uh, both tests as being conclusive in 72 hours. Just a little over two years ago, or a little under two years ago, ASTM now recognizes that the RH or in situ test is now conclusive in 24 hours. So that's driving a lot more people to that test. But hopefully what's driving that is also that they're getting a really good value that they can then take to the bank as far as installing a wood floor. You know, over the years and talking about the relationship between uh, moisture and wood, uh, an analogy I've used, I don't know how successful it is, but if someone takes a squirt gun and squirts you or takes a garden hose and points it at you, well, in all likelihood, your clothes might absorb some of the moisture. That person may annoy you, but it's not going to knock you over. But if I stand you next to a fire hydrant and turn it on, you're not going to be able to withstand that force. So when we talk about moisture, uh, the problem with moisture is not that it's moisture, it's when it is excessive moisture. When the wood is not able to absorb and release it in a natural way. And by the way, when you have grass growing up in between your board seams, that is not a good sign. Well, once again, I, I know that some of the material today uh, is a little bit dry. Uh, so we're going to take a little break in the action. If anyone knows the name of this dog or what we call him, type it into the chat and I will send you a Panera e gift card to the first person who correctly identifies the name of this dog. So that was our intermission break, and now we're going to continue on. And I like this question, why do adhesives matter to your project? Um, 
for those of you who know me, and I'm kind of a wine guy, that's why I like this illustration showing the, the pairing of wine and cheese, because the right pairing of adhesive to flooring is very, very critical. Just like, you know, going to a wine and cheese tasting, there are certain cheeses that go better with certain wines and vice versa. In fact, if someone um, invited you to their home and said, hey, we're going to cook up steak. Can you bring a bottle of wine? In all likelihood, you would bring a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. Or if they said, hey, we're going to grill some salmon, uh, uh, um, bring a bottle of wine. You'd probably bring a, a nice white Riesling. Well, what happens if someone says, hey, we're having pizza tonight. Bring the wine. What wine pairs with um, pizza? Actually, it would be a Chianti. And for any of you who email me, I will even let you know what wine is good with Doritos. Anyways, the point that I'm making is that just as wine goes with certain foods, adhesives go with the right project. You, what you want to do is match the adhesive with what your objectives are in that installation. So the next slide, not all adhesives are created equal. Think about it from, from this standpoint. A lot more of us are doing projects at home. Uh, maybe we're putting together a table or a chair. Well, when we do that type of hobby, we want that adhesive to be rigid because we don't want those independent elements of wood moving, particularly if we're eating from it or sitting on it. But now think of a wood floor. You have hundreds, if not thousands of pieces of wood moving independently. And so therefore you need an adhesive that allows for that. Um, so years ago, I think it was around 2007, I, um, we had the, the first Bona Regional Training Center in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. And this was before uh, Bona was selling adhesives uh, in North America. We were doing them in, in Europe for a lot longer than that. Well, anyways, I had taken some construction adhesive, used it around the perimeter because I had borders, a hearth and fireplace and so forth. Well, eventually at some point after sanding that floor 18 years of uh, trainings and schools, had to replace it. And I noticed that when I pulled the flooring up, I looked at the back of the boards where I had used construction adhesive. And the adhesive was dry, chalky, and brittle. And essentially what had happened, this environment where I had the training center would sometimes be at 20% relative humidity. Other times it would be at 90% relative, relative humidity. Well, those swings of RH eventually caused enough stress on that rigid adhesive where it simply disbonded. And uh, I learned quite a bit uh, from pulling that floor up and was able to do a lot more research into it. So once again, not all adhesives are created equal. And that is definitely true when it comes to healthier choices uh, within adhesives. You know, the air that we breathe has become a lot more personal a personal space uh, to each and every one of us. And I think it's important, once again, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we look for third party certification. And, uh, you know, having been in this industry for a while, I have seen a lot of greenwashing. I have seen products that one day uh, on the label, there were like skulls and crossbones. And then the next day, there's kittens and unicorns. And yes, I am stretching the bounds of credulity with that statement. But I'm exaggerating that point for a reason. Just because a marketing department puts a fig leaf on a product does not make it environmentally friendly. And so third-party certification is a much better choice than looking at what the manufacturer has uh, used uh, on that particular label. You know, when I got actively involved with adhesives uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I started reading technical data sheets. By the way, this also coincides with the time period when people stopped inviting me uh, to their parties. But anyways, 
when I was reading these TDSs, I was amazed at how many words I was reading and how little data or numeric values I was seeing. I was seeing uh, expressions like uh, exceeds or highest in the industry or exceptionally adequate. Okay, but what does that tell me? I wanted to see more numeric values so that I could compare the two. Um, my colleague Wayne Highlander has a very good uh, illustration. I'm going to steal it, but I did give him credit for it. Um, Wayne is a bodybuilder, and he says this if he could bench press 400 pounds, he would work it into every conversation he has ever had or will have in the future. So if you have good values, wouldn't you want to broadcast those good values? So I'm gonna explain some of those different properties. Most of you know what they are, but I'll go into it a little bit later. But I also want to encourage the use of reading safety data sheets. In fact, I'd also like and encourage any of you, whatever products that you have in your vans, in your trucks, in your shops, that you have the safety data sheets available in case something ever happened. One of the values of reading safety data sheets is that you get the uh, what they call the HMIS ratings, hazardous material information sheets. And I was looking at one safety data sheet recently where the uh, fire level was considered a three. And that rating means that it was a serious rating. So why would we want to bring an adhesive that has a fire rating of serious into any project that any of us could be on? And then the other thing that, you know, when we talk about fastening for the future, adhesives really help when it comes to sound control. Think of an adhesive as a decoupling agent. It separates the wood from the substrate. And that's why there are adhesives on the marketplace that can give you very high IIC ratings, 71 out of the pale or 65 STC that may eliminate uh, the need to use a sound control underlayment for that particular project. And now we also have a lot more uh, variety of substrates out there. I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. Um, obviously over concrete, there are adhesives that perform exceptionally well over that. When it comes to gypsum, when gypsum is dry, Gypsum is very dusty. You can vacuum it and sweep it all you want. Uh, urethane adhesives don't really like gypsum because it, uh, the adhesive has a tendency to crawl over. It doesn't really wet out. Uh, but with silane-based adhesives, uh, it's able to become miscible with that dust. And so it doesn't affect uh, the application of that product as well. Uh, I have to tell you the first time I installed a floor over radiant heat. I was doing another section of the home. They were, the radiant was going in a, another room that I was going to eventually install. And the uh, radiant technician was there. And uh, so I asked him, I said, hey, by the way, what happens if I put a nail through one of these um, tubes? And he told me, he said, he just looked at me and said, you don't want to know. And guess what? I believed him. And I never put any kind of a nail uh, through uh, radiant heat too. And then just keep in mind also uh, that there are some adhesives, uh, particularly urethanes, that could potentially etch uh, these PEX tubes that are associated with radiant heat. And then obviously specify a good OSB because what you want to make sure is that the bond between the wood and the adhesive doesn't overpower the in uh, structural integrity of the substrate. And years ago, um, a lot of us remember uh, shooting plywood down over concrete. Nowadays, you can successfully glue plywood down. We recommend it, cutting it into uh, three sheets so that instead of, uh, instead of cutting them in half, 
you have 16 inch wide, eight inch long, perf the back, and now you can do a full spread adhesive with plywood over concrete. Advantech has become very popular. Some manufacturers recommend abrading the Advantech. Others want you to use a primer. So just follow their recommendations. Uh, very good, stable product. And we're seeing a lot more warm board. Uh, this is a, a good product as well. Uh, they have recommended uh, several adhesives to be used over their products. Just make sure that once again, uh, you be careful about not getting uh, a urethane adhesive on that PEX tubing due to the fact that it could etch. And it's also good that there are adhesives out there that stick really well to metal. We're seeing a lot more metal fabrication uh, that is being associated with wood. And so that is also a potential. And then the other thing I would mention is that when you have to use a cork or a rubber underlayment, endeavor to use the same adhesive underneath the underlayment as well as on top of the underlayment that's going to secure the wood floor so that you have more balanced construction. Well, when it comes to the different types of floors to install, you look for different properties. And I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. You know, since almost 65, 67% of flooring out there is pre-finished, use an adhesive that is easy to clean off of the surface. What you don't want is an adhesive to etch into or eat into that pre-finished floor. When it comes to end grain, end grain is under more forces of tensile than shear, and so you want to make sure that you have good tensile strength because of that up and down movement. When it comes to solid wood floor, you want the big three. You want shear, uh, you want uh, uh, elongation, and you want moisture protection. And by the way, when I say elongation, the nickname I give it is wiggle room. In other words, if the room goes out of its normal equilibrium, the adhesive allows it to move. And then when the room reverts back to its normal equilibrium, the adhesive actually has the ability to pull it back into position. And then obviously with wide plank floors, you want those same big three that we mentioned with solid. And then with a vertical application, uh, I really don't have to go into too much depth on this one. Uh, you definitely want that tenacious bond. I was uh, uh, Googling information online recently, and I saw that in New York City, uh, a wall had been installed and they put a mirror up and uh, the mirror disbonded from the wall and hurt some of the patrons uh, that were there. Uh, the newspaper article uh, ended with this note, the restaurant declined to comment. So anytime you're doing a wall system, make sure that you have that tenacious bond. So when it comes to technology that is out there, uh, urethane adhesives have been around since the mid nineties. And I can tell you for one, I, I was grateful when that technology was introduced, because as I mentioned earlier, um, we didn't know what we were going to use when chlorinated solvent went away. Um, and so uh, we all got used to using it. The only downside, once again, is if we got it on the surface of a pre-finished floor and we didn't clean it up immediately, uh, those were boards that we were going to have to replace. Um, I uh, read and I grade inspection reports, and I saw one a couple of, um, probably two years ago, an inspector had gone out to look at a floor. He opened the door. It was 1,500 square feet. He says that he saw 1,200 pieces of blue tape all over that floor. Guess what? Identifying every spot of glue that was not able to be removed. So, um, while it bonds wood floors very, very successfully, there is newer technology out there. We already talked about silanes. Silanes, while it's new, um, newer technology, it's not new. It's been on the market since 2004. And I will tell you that I believe it's 87% of wood floors over in Europe 
are being installed with side lanes. And once again, they don't nail anything over there. They're gluing everything down and we are seeing a lot more uh, silane products uh, being sold in North America. And so that presentation um, or that situation continues uh, to develop. So anytime we have products that can help our industry, it's really important that we share this information with as many people as possible. A lot of advantages to silanes. In most cases, the shear strengths are greater, the elongation factor is better. And once again, if you get these silane adhesives on the surface of a pre finished floor, you are able to clean it up. Most manufacturers say do it within 72 hours. I have cleaned up intentional silane spots a year after the fact. It simply does not etch the surface of a pre finished floor. And I'll tell you where the story began. Uh, the Copenhagen airport is all wood floors. Well, they were expanding the airport in the mid 90s. They used a urethane adhesive. Some of the sections started to dislodge. Technician goes in, goes to repair the floor, um, goes out to his truck, doesn't have any urethane adhesive. Well, he's a floor guy, just like a lot of us were. So he finds whatever's in his van will work. And he had some MS sealant with him. And he's like, well, this will get me through a little bit so I can do the repair and they'll always come back and do the re repair correctly. Well, weeks later, other sections started to come loose, but not the section that was done with the MS polymer. Well, this had a lot of your uh, European uh, chemists scratching their head because they looked at this and they said, huh, because in their minds, this was a extremely disruptive um, technology because from their expert opinion, this was not supposed to work. And yet the floors didn't listen to the experts and were laying quite well. So this led to the development of silane adhesives. And once again, uh, is really the, the lion's share of what's being used over in Europe. So kind of a fascinating story when you think about, you know, kind of an aha moment uh, that has, uh, uh, allows technology uh, to improve. And we're seeing a lot more nail and glue assist. Uh, last year, NWFA updated their guidelines. It went from 70 pages to over 180. And there is now a two page section in there that talks about the value of nail and glue assist. You know, when we were installing two and a quarter inch boards, if you followed the manufacturer's directions, in an area about the size of a four by eight sheet of plywood, you'd have 130 fasteners in that floor. Now what happens when we install six inch plank? You actually have two thirds fewer fasteners when you really need more, once again, because of that dimensional change coefficient. And so now there are guidelines that when you're dealing with five inch and beyond, that you do it as a nail and glue assist. And that really goes a long way towards securing that particular installation. And then, you know, your trowel is basically a metering device or measuring device of putting down the correct adhesive. And the other thing that you have the opportunity to do, there's a lot more moisture uh, mitigation materials um, that you're able to roll on. Once again, it does not completely block the substrate, but what it does is it's able to minimize that transmigration of moisture so that the wood can absorb it and desorb it, and therefore that floor will continue to be successfully installed. And then when it comes to warranties, just like TDS sheets, SDS sheets, read the warranty, find out what the manufacturer will cover, what they won't cover, I will tell you this right now, if you own your own business and you're uh, a, a wood floor installer, you are far better at protecting your business than any manufacturer. Read the warranties, make sure what is covered versus what is not covered. Um, look skeptically 
app products that say that they are unlimited, they can perform anywhere. Uh, we know that wood uh, thrives and succeeds in certain environments, and we know where it does not thrive and succeed. And keep in mind, God made other flooring materials for those floors that are too high in moisture content for wood. And so I talked about at the beginning, fastening for the future, specifying for the future. We have a responsibility uh, towards those who come after us. And once again, if we have products that are better for the environment and better for the consumer and better for the homeowner and their families, then we do have an obligation to let that be known. So this is what we've learned today. I'm not going to read it to you uh, for one reason, because I can't see it, because the words are really, really tiny on my screen. But these are some of the things that we have talked about. And uh, hopefully uh, today's presentation has uh, uh, made you ask a couple of questions or raised a couple of eyebrows. And with that, I am going to I'm uh, done with my presentation and I will turn it over to Christine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. If the audience has any questions or comments, please submit them in the question box on the left of your screen. Um, we'll wait a few moments for people to enter in their questions. Um, in the meantime, we do have a couple already. Um, so Dave, the first question is regarding the glue assist. Can you review the correct way to perform this? Which adhesive for this, and how should we? How should it be applied? So, there are products out there that are in sausage format. Bona RE51 is an example of that, and it can be done a number of different ways. It can be done in that serpentine bead pattern. Uh, it can be uh, parallel stripes. Uh, it can be more of a, a U. And all you really want to do is make sure that you keep the adhesive away from uh, the groove section of the wood because you don't want uh, it to bond uh, with the tongue of the uh, preceding board. Uh, but the nail and glue assist will go a long way towards, once again, minimizing direct contact between wood and wood and keep a lot of your sound, um, uh, sources of sound down. Second part of that same question is, which adhesive should be used for this? Um, well, how should it be applied? I think you might've addressed that. Yeah, I, th I think I addressed that. Since I'm doing the presentation today, I get to uh, champion uh, our bonus particular adhesive and uh, our 850T uh, would be the one that I would recommend. Question, which adhesive is the best to use over radiant heat? And should the system be turned on during the installation? Um, and if so, at what temperature? Okay, so a lot of these radiant uh, from the source, they're around 103 so that the floor winds up being 82 degrees. Um, I believe NWFA recommends that that system should be cycling for two weeks prior to installation. There are some manufacturers out there that want that system operational for over a month. And once again, if you are faced with the choice between uh, silanes and urethanes, if silane adhesives do get on that PEX tubing, there's no chance of it etching um, that PEX tubing. So uh, the silanes uh, like Bona RA51 would be an excellent choice for both warm board and other radiant systems. Next question, is it necessary to prime a gypsum underlayment before gluing on my floor? Is a primer or sealer required? So some adhesive manufacturers will recommend uh, that you prime in order to get greater adhesion. And that, and that comes when I talked about earlier that that gypcrete is, uh, can be very dusty. And interesting note on gypcrete, when you pour it uh, and it dries, um, there's a layer of latience that kind of rises to the top. I, 
I call it pond scum. And so a lot of times, if you abrade the surface of the gypsum, you will expose more gypsum and eliminate some of that latience, that weakening effect that can be on the top surface of the gypsum. That's why some manufacturers want you to prime it. I would rather see people abrade it, expose more gypsum, and then go ahead install with silane-based adhesive. All right, we have two more questions. Um, we're coming up to the um, end of the hour, so I'll read these real quick. In a high-rise residential installation, we are required to meet sound criteria. Can the adhesive you mentioned meet our requirements, or do we need, or do we still need a sound mat in between? Depending on what the building owner has set for a standard, you may or you may not. Um, so that's why looking at the technical data sheets and finding out exactly the IIC and STC that is available right out of the pail at full spread many times will make it not needed to have that underlayment. It's all going to depend on what that uh, building owner or a management group decides what their ratings are going to be. Next question. In the past, when installing over certain types of OSB, I noticed that some adhesives don't adhere as well to, to the waxy coating on some brands. What is the best practice for maximum adhesion? So the two best practices would be to abrade and then install or Sir, uh, or to use a primer that will then allow for better adhesion. Okay, and then Dave, uh, you wanted, or you had asked everybody the name of the dog. We had three responses. <laughs> Fire away. Um, all of them, the dog's name, they guessed was Bona. So the dog's name is Bonafide. Or I would have accepted bona fide. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, all three of you win. Make sure I get your email addresses, and I'm very happy to send you the gift card. Okay, well, that uh, comes to the end of our program. Unfortunately, there aren't there isn't any more time to answer any more questions. So on behalf of SCICA, we thank Dave for presenting today's webinar. Sims, you may now navigate to the Submit Credit tab to receive credit. Please note that you must be signed into the educational platform for this feature to work. If you have any issues, please let us know. Uh, thank you again, Dave. This is the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And have a great rest of your day.